I've got, I think, the best talk of the afternoon, to be honest. So this is all the sexy stuff that's not thyroid or lymph nodes. Okay, these are the things that you kind of come across, you're like, go, okay, well, what is that? So, um, so the plan is just to kind of introduce you, so you get an idea of what things look like, kind of on a, you know, if you put an ultrasound probe on something, what it's gonna, the features of it, to try and help you. Um, we'll start with some salivary glands and then we'll go on to the other things in, in, in the neck that uh, do occasionally crop up. And all, all, the, all the images that are on here are from things that have come across through my list and um, have been biopsies. So we're gonna start at the top, so the parotid space. So, it's just... so um, inflammation of the parotid glands, so salinitis can, can present as obviously a diffuse swelling. And the point with ultrasound is, as Susie um, alluded to, is like the information that you give us will help us in giving you a sensible differential in terms of um, what we put on the radiology report. So kind of things that we want to kind of think about is this kind of unilateral versus bilateral. So as Nav mentioned, unilateral kind of presentations of parotid swelling that are diffuse. Could this be an bacterial infection? Could it be due to a stone or a combination of the two things? Bilateral involvement in adults, we're kind of thinking about, is there a history of Trojan's an autoimmune condition? So when they're sat there in front of me, I often ask the question, do you suffer with dry mucous membranes, eyes, mouth, that kind of thing? To see if they say yes or no, which will give me an idea. Viral etiologies tend to be more in kids, which we don't tend to see at MFT because we've got a separate children's department. But they're, they're also something that can cause uh, bilateral diffuse swellings. Um, and what, do, what does it look like? Well, on ultrasound, you get this kind of diffuse enlargement of the gland volume. It looks heterogeneous in, in terms of its echogenicity. So, and so that, and there could be within that, there could be hypoechoic darker components as well as brighter components, is what, what I mean by heterogeneous. And when you put the color Doppler on, much like you saw with the thyroiditis picture earlier on in the in one of the early talks, you kind of get that florid kind of appearance in terms of increased vascularity within the gland in the acute phase. Okay, so pills and pitfalls with this. So obviously things to watch out for are complications <laughs> thereof, especially if it's a obstructing calculus that's caused a secondary bacterial infection, how they developed an abscess, what does that look like? Well, a hypoechoic collection, which if it's Obviously, we, we call abscesses organized collections sometimes in our reports. They're both the same thing. They'll have a, a wall to it normally, which will be, be thickened. Okay. Um, if you do see something, it's often important to interrogate the length of the duct, the parotid duct, to see if there's a calculus distally towards its entrance at, into, the, into the oral cavity, because it's not always towards the hilum of the glands. And if things don't settle down after a course of antibiotics and we've they've come from an ultrasound, we think this looks like an infection. If there's a residual mass there, it's often prudent to either re-ultrasound them, so if we need to, we can do an FNA, as well as get some cross-sectional imaging with an MR, just to see if there is a is an underlying mass that's caused all of this to 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 come to to your clinic. Okay, next question. So um, so this is, I mean, so this is. A uh, picture of actually the accessory parotid gland, um, and you can see how um, heterogeneous it is in terms of its echogenicity. If you remember before when we were looking at the parotid gland on the normal um, ultrasound talk, how uniform it was in terms of its echogenicity to make that comparison. So I always have that kind of in the back of your head. What does normal look like? So you can spot abnormal. Um, and then I think the next one has got some Doppler. So there's some. Call it Doppler. It's not as florid as I'd expect, but there is some Doppler in there. Okay. So, Schrodinger syndrome. So, tends to present this, say, in the acute phases, bilateral um, enlarged glands. And then with time, the gland parenchyma tends to get smaller and smaller because it becomes atrophic. When you look at the, the gland itself on, on ultrasound, you tend to see a lot of rounded, hypochoic dark spots within it which is kind of the classic kind of appearance. Um, some of these can have a bit of a solid component to them when they get a bit bigger. And again, because it's a, an inflammatory process, you can get an increase in vascularity, which you'll see on the, on the color Doppler, if you were to put that on. And 
with those kind of solid components, they can become larger and they can mimic a, a tumour. And obviously with trojans, there is the risk of malignancy in terms of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is always something that we keep in the back of our mind when we're scanning patients that have a known history of trojans and they're presented with a protted lump. Let's get the next one. So pearls and pitfalls. So often when we're asked to scan um, these patients and they, the, the question is, is it kind of Schrosians because they've got the clinical symptoms? If it's early, it can look sonographically normal. So it doesn't actually exclude them having Schrosians. It just, at that point in time, the glands look normal. Okay. Um, things to watch out for is if when you're scanning, you find a dominant mass within the parotid. And also if there's associated survival lymphopathy, that'd be concerning for one of these lymphoproliferative conditions which is mentioned like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is an increased risk in trojans. Um, so we'll come on to kind of a, examining and what we're looking for in, in, in malignant tumours. But essentially it's kind of, as with thyroid um, nodules, kind of that margin is important in terms of, is it well-defined, irregular, does it have that kind of aggressive appearance to it, like it's spreading out through the glands. Um, with trojans, you probably <laughs> want to do a, um, an MR silogram just to look at the ducts themselves um, and a lot of these things that we're going to talk about in this first half of the section there's a lot of overlap in terms of how they look sonographically hence the comment about the information you give us helps is kind of in our head when the patients in front of us in the in ultrasound room kind of make a sensible kind of suggestion of what might be going on in correlation with the imaging so things like benign lymphopathelial lesions which are associated with people with HIV um, Warthrin's tumours can, can, can sometimes have a similar appearance, metastatic disease, and even parotid sarcoidosis, which is, which is rare, but it can have a similar sonographic appearance taken in isolation without any kind of context. Um, next. So just to orientate you, so um, kind of mandible here. So this is the parotid gland here. Can you see all these little dark spots within it, these hypoechoic bits. So these, this is what Schrosians looks like on, on ultrasound. Okay. So, and again, similar again. So again, these dark spots, and this is, this is in someone with, with a confirmed Schrosians diagnosis. Um, next one. So benign lymphoepithelial lesions can look a bit like that on, on ultrasounds, tend to be slightly bigger in terms of how how big those cystic changes are within the gland. Things that we would correlate with when we're scanning, doing a diagnostic next week is, is there any lymphadenopathy? Are they known to have a diagnosis of HIV? Sometimes this is the first time that they can present without knowing that they have that diagnosis. So it's something to keep in mind. And obviously it affects both sides, both parotid glands. Um, when you interrogate how the cystic lesions look, they're not entirely anechoic. So anechoic means just like uh, completely black, nothing within them, okay? You can get um, slight heterogeneity and then you can see sometimes some thin septations with blood vessels in, within these cystic changes, okay? Or, or nodules. Um, so I've got to think about a picture. Can I get the next one? So I kind of said this a little bit. So, pills, sorry, can you go back? So, <laughs> so pills, people. So sometimes when they present, especially if they get a rather large cystic component, there is the kind of the differential of this. Could this be a branchial cleft cyst, first branchial cleft cyst, um, which is always a, something we'd probably think about when we're writing our reports. Um, but if we're thinking that it's kind of HIV related, you know, we could do some follow-up imaging. We're looking with like a CT or an MR. We can see if there's anything with the the, the, the tonsils or the lymphadenopathy in the neck to, to make a fuller assessment of that. Um, so what it looks like. Um, so again, if you think back to the last picture, so per, um, parotid here, this is your mandible. You see like these bigger cystic spaces kind of throughout the gland with some blood flow in them. 
um, so they're slightly bigger. And then if you go to the next the MR, and this is what it looks like on an MR scan. Can you, you can see these bigger cystic spaces? So if you just take that top bit there, if you imagine this was a Schrosian's patient, for example, these kind of tiny cystic spaces is what you'd see throughout the whole gland, that kind of size. Okay, some of these are bigger. So this was a this was sampled, and this came back on on uh, cytology as being fully BLE. So, uh, so protid masses. So as 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 um, Nav mentioned, with regard to the protid, the majority, the vast majority, are benign lesions, um, which we don't need to worry about. But as you will come to find in the next few slides, there's a lot of overlap in terms of how things look sonographically. So there's always that element of could we be missing something? Hence why we do the addition of doing an FNA to get that cytological evaluation to put both things together. So um, obviously if it's a PSA, as I've mentioned, there's a risk of malignant transformation. So they would often be offered a surgical option in terms of um, taking that out. Um, and the key to parotid masses, as I've mentioned, is how they look in terms of their margin. So if something is irregular margin, it's ill-defined, it looks like it's spreading out through the gland, that looks aggressive, that's going to be something malignant, as opposed to something that's well-defined. You can see the border, you can trace it around with a pencil. Okay, um, so the caveat to that is that low-grade malignancies, such as low-grade adenocystic or mucopidermoid, can look like PSAs as well, hence why we do the FNA. So if we go to the next slide. So a majority of pleomorphic adenomas tend to be in the, in the, in the superficial lobe, um, they tend to be less frequent in the other salivary glands, such as submandibular. And the key feature on ultrasounds is that it's a well-defined lobulated or bosulated lesion. So kind of a bit of a, a bump <coughs> to it as around the margin. It's hypoechoic. You see this posterior acoustic enhancement. So much like you can maybe get a bit of calcium, you see a shadow behind. What you see in this case is, a, is some, something bright. Okay, behind it, you can get increased um, vascularity within it. And I think the next one is a uh, picture. So pills and pitfalls with this. So if it becomes large, like over two centimeters, that kind of uniform hypochoic appearance to it can change. It can become slightly heterogeneous and it can start to mimic maybe a Wolfram's tumor in terms of its appearance. Um, and obviously, from a clinical history point of view, if there's some kind of history of rapid enlargement of this, maybe they've, they've had this pleomorphic adenoma diagnosed before, then you, they come to us because suddenly it's increasing in size. That's a kind of worrying feature which would make us want to stick a needle in it for you. Okay, and then I think that's the picture. So here's that kind of uh, hypoechoic appearance within the parotid gland itself. You can see that it's got l lobulated uh, margin and that's that posterior acoustic enhancement you're seeing that bright shadow behind. So that's what a pleomorphic looks like. Okay, um, next slide. And again, something similar. So again, that lobulated margin, hypoechoic appearance to it with the posterior acoustic enhancement in the superficial lobe of the parotid. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, next one. So, Wolfram's tumors. Second most parotid, common parotid lesion. Again, history is useful because these tend to be in the older patients that we see. And I often ask about, have they been a smoker before? Clinical scenario that we would tend to get is that someone comes to our list and they've been for, you know, um, through the lung MDT and they found a bright spot in the, on the FDG and in the parotid because Wolfram's tumors are FDG avid. So it's likely to be that it's going to be a warfarin rather than a metastatic interparotid lymph node. Okay, but you still need to do the FNA to confirm that. Other clues on imaging would be that these things are multiple, 
either in, in the same side or on both sides. And they tend to be classically centered within the parotid tail. That's the other clue on imaging as well. So Warthrins are bilateral, multiple, people of an older age with a smoking history. Um, and how do they look like? Well, again, they, they're kind of, they're well-defined in terms of their margin, you can trace around it. They're, they're heterogeneous in terms of their echogenicity. And if you look carefully, you can sometimes see that there are some, well, like septations in the middle, like lines interspersed with cystic spaces. And again, they can have debris within them and they can have some blood flow within it as well. So I think pills and pitfalls next. So pills and pitfalls for this are, you know, if they come with one side that's really big, always have a look at the other side as well to see if you can pick up that second or third lesion. Um, interrogate how it looks, get that kind of, confirm that smoking or ex-smoker history, which is associated with these um, lesions and do the FNA to confirm that that's the, that's what it is. M malignant transformation is very rare within these, but again, as with other tumors that are malignant, it's that margin that's that kind of the key to, to assessing this is if something is more sinister and to be worried about. So, so again, so left parotid. So can you see some cystic spaces within it and then you get the impression that there's some lines within it, these septations. Okay, again, it's well defined. You can see again, it's some posterior acoustic asthma and it's got some blood flow within it. I think there's a bigger one on the next slide. Yeah, so it's a slightly bigger one um, within this. So that kind of heterogeneous appearance, again, the third one. So some cystic spaces within them and you get the impression that there are these kind of septations within it. Um, okay. And then that's, if there's, an, if there's additional imaging, like on our sector, you can look at the imaging. If they've had a PET scan, it's always worth having a quick look. And this is what you'll see. So this is someone bilateral Warthrin's tumors that are avid on PET. Next question. So parotid schwannoma. Um, obviously the facial nerve courses through the parotid. It's not, I've come across these in terms of, not in ultrasound, but in terms of reporting and incidental finding on an MR scan. It tends to be more, come across them in the trunk, just below the stylomastoid foramen. Um, but they would tend to have a similar appearance in terms of they're well-defined, they're hypoechoic, and they're within the gland itself. And they, you can see that they have an overlapping appearance with, with, with just uh, other lesions within the, within the process that we've, get, we've come across already. So again, especially if they have internal cystic change, I mean, that could look like a Warthrin's a little bit, I guess, or a pleomorphic, if you don't see that lobulated margin. Um, so again, just something to be aware of. Um, Next, next slide, so masses. So the other thing in terms of, of masses, apart from the, the margin, um, are kind of looking for like lymph nodes within the neck as well. Are there associated abnormal lymph nodes which you can get with mucoepidermoid um, carcinoma in terms of metastases? So what do they kind of look like? So as I've already mentioned, there's a lot of overlap with these structures, especially the, with regard to the low grade um, um, categories of, of uh, adenocystic and mucoepidermoid. So it's just essentially, you can't really tell the difference on ultrasound. You'd need the FNA to, to, to get the answer. So what they, I think the next one's the, so this is the parotid here. So again, it's kind of regular margin it's kind of all kind of coming out. It just doesn't look quite benign. And the next one I think is more can so that's so they're kind of low grade features, yeah. And next so again another low grade feature. So you can see uh, again this is a, a low grade adenocystic. You can see that that looks pretty much like a pleomorphic that I've shown on a previous slide. Okay. The next one. So the high grade ones, next. <clears throat> so this rather ill-defined in the parotid, can't really define a definitive margin, just like it's kind of creeping out through the parotid, um, 
parenchyma. I think there's another slide that shows a similar example. So again, rather ill-defined in terms of its margin, hypoechoic. Um, so again, this is, this is one to worry about when you see it on ultrasound. Next slide. So um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can present um, in the parotid gland because so you've got lymph nodes within there, in, in the glands. Um, you want to look for other associated features like before we mentioned about cervical lymphadenopathy. Are, are there lymph nodes involved? And it can either appear as a, like as if you've seen a rather infiltrative mass or, or, or even as a focal hypoechoic mass that's just presented as a unilateral lump. And again, if there's a history of erosions, that might be the clues to what's going on um, within within the parotid. So just... Yeah, I've kind of said that. It's the next one. So what does it look like? So this is this was a confirmed case of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the parotid. So again, take our messages. What do the margins look like? It's hypoechoic, it's ill-defined, it looks aggressive and sinister as opposed to being the well-defined. So, okay. So moving on to the sub floor of mouth region. So next slide. So we've kind of covered this in the normal anatomy um, part, but again, these malahyoid which near defects, basically it's the gland herniating through the malahyoid muscle, can be bilateral, unilateral. And often when you're looking at it, you, you can tell it because it's anterior you can see the sublingual submandibular gland is 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 uh, behind the sublingual tissue. And why did I put this in again? Because I've obviously got a case that presented as a mass in the level one B region, which just turned out to be such one of these. So next slide. So this is just an example of just the defect here. It's, it's kind of poking through. And the next next slide. Next slide. So this this is the one that presented. So you can see here's the myelohyoid muscle. Here's this the posterior border, and then see the bits kind of up here. All this is a big hole in it, and you can see that all the sub with sublingual glands herniated through. Okay, and then go to the next slide. So all this is sublingual gland through this big hole here, and then I got a, an image of. Next slide. So this is the sublingual gland, and then this is the SMG at the back here. Um, and then we've got an MR scan, just for those of you that don't believe me. <laughs> here it is here, on the MR scan with this sub submandibular gland here. <clears throat> okay. So you will notice on the slides that you just look at the echogenicity of the sublingual gland, how uniform it was. You know, there wasn't any heterogeneity there to suggest that it's kind of inflamed or anything like that. So, ranulars, so they can either be simple or, or plunging, as, as Nav uh, mentioned. They tend to be unilateral, they're hypoechoic, um, thin, thin walled, and you can't really discern any kind of, you can't really discern a, a wall to it at all. And the, the plunging ones, they tend to have the kind of, they have this kind of tail as they come, come out. Whereas, and they kind of, when it's plunging, it basically passes through the myelohyoid muscle in, into, the, into the neck. Um, if they're, they can either pass straight backwards towards the back end of the myelohyoid muscle and then down, or they can come laterally and out through the, the myelohyoid muscle. Okay, um, and these lateral ones that come through the malahide muscle tend to be the more common variety. Um, so again, pills and pitfalls. So other things to consider in the floor of mouth are other lesions, which are kind of congenital, so from an epidermoid or a silocele. So these tend to be slightly off midline. Dermoid lesions, tend to be centered more towards the, the midline. 
and sometimes we can't tell the difference in ultrasound between a dermoid and an epidermoid cyst, but these are all the kind of differential things we would think about um, in the floor of the mouth when we see something like this. So what does it look like? So with this one, this is the sublingual gland here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go from, from the front of level 1A and go backwards sequentially. So just to orientate you. So this is malahyoid here, sublingual gland. And this is the mandible here. So you've got all this shadow behind. And you're starting to see something hypochoic here that's in contact with the sublingual gland that's, slight, that's bulging through. If you go to the next slide. So as you go backwards, so malahyoid, this thing next to the mandible here, this is getting bigger, then back again. And then you can see it's becoming more um, anechoic. Okay, then back one more. And then this is, this is the ranula here. So the bit we saw before was a bit of the tail and it's kind of going backwards and down into, into the neck. So this is the ranula. So I think the next one's the MR, I think. No, oh, so, so yeah, so again, here's the ranula here um, within the level one B region. And then here you can see, here's the defect, here's the sublingual gland, and then this is the ranula coming out and down into the neck. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I mentioned um, dermoid epidermoids. Sometimes you can't tell the difference between the two. Dermoids can have um, echidity within them because that's of the content. So the content can be fat. Uh, they can show some calcifications um, more towards the midline. They're the clues. Epidermoid is it's off midline to the side. Um, again, can have central um, debris within it, posterior cruising enhancement. It's all sounding very familiar, isn't it? All these things are very dark. They all enhance behind them. Um, because it's uh, cystic, it doesn't have any internal vascularity. So, I've got a next slide. So this was actually someone that um, presented. They'd had a swelling here for over a decade underneath their mandible. Had never bothered them, had never bothered getting it looked into and they'd come for something else into the hospital and they'd ended up having some imaging done. And what we can see is <clears throat> this is the floor of mouth here, the, the malahyoid, and this is within the sublingual space just slightly <coughs> up to the midline, so to the right. You've got all these, it's hypoechoic, it's got these kind of this debris within it. You can see that there's some, looks like there's some kind of a line of um, hyperechidogenicity along the edge, okay, which turned out to be a bit of calcification around the periphery of this lesion, which was a uh, epidermoid. So I think the next one is the CT. So this is here. So again, it's got some calcification within. So this is the the epidermoid in the floor of their mouth. Okay. Um, Silenitis. So, again, similar to kind of parotiditis, you're going to get kind of heterogeneous appearance, increased blood flow within the parenchyma, enlargement of the of the volume. Um, but otherwise, the configuration, other than it getting bigger, stays the same. As in, you don't get any bulging. Nothing's kind of coming out, and looks like it's infiltrating into the surrounding tissues. Um, you want to have a look along the length of the duct if you're suspecting a calculus. Often either you find it at the level of the hilum or further along the duct towards the, 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 the floor of mouth punctum. And what do, what do the, these, these stones look like? Well, you'll see basically a, a linear hyperechoic focus with this shadowing behind it. Okay. Um, other things to watch out for are kind of associations, as we've mentioned with the protoditis, kind of a abscess formation, this kind of thing. Um, if you remember back to the anatomy talk and about seeing the back of the malahyoid muscle with the hyoglossus below it, and in between that 
in that corridor where the duct runs, that's where you're supposed to be looking. If you forget that, sometimes people have confused the tip of the greater corner of the hyoid for a calculus, because that can, as you, you're scanning, it kind of comes into focus. And it's, they, 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 they make that mistake. Um, if you don't see a, an ultrasound, a calculus, sometimes if it's operator dependent, for example, it doesn't mean there isn't a calculus. So get some cross-sectional imaging, you know, whether that's a CT or, or, or an MR to, to see if there is a ductal burden of the stones. And obviously you need to inspect the whole length of the duct if you can, to make sure you don't miss something that's very anterior. Um, and there might be some reactive lymph nodes because of the inflammatory process that's going off in level one and two. So what does that look like? So with this one, so this is the submandibular gland here. So if you remember back to the morning lecture, rather uniform, this looks a bit more heterogeneous in its appearance. And you can see this, this dark um, tubular structure here. And what this is, this is dilatation of the um, intraparenchymal ducts towards the hilum. So if we go, to, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go forwards. So the next one. So this, so hyoid, hyoglossus, there's that corridor. This is the hilum of the gland. You can see this is the duct here that it's, before we didn't see it this morning, did we, when it's normal, but now we're seeing it. So we're going to come forward a, a bit more into the floor of the mouth. So again, here's the duct. We're going to see Malahyoid and hyoglossus. I've slightly rotated the probe so you get a kind of a bit more of a bleak view along that corridor. And you're starting to see something coming in here. Some, and then on the next, on the next slide, here's the, the ducts here. And then this is that stone that's towards the front, the floor of mouth. Okay. So, and then this is an example of some stones, so multiple stones at the level of the the hilum in the glands. So again, that linear hyperechoic uh, band with just shadowing behind it. So, so um, chronic inflammation. Um, so chronic sclerosing salinitis is a cutting a tumour. So that can present as a unilateral mass. It's thought to be part of the IgG4 autoimmune spectrum of disease where it can affect other things in the body uh, like um, lacrimal glands, pancreas, kidneys. Um, tends to affect the submandibular glands most in terms of when it presents. And you get this kind of, it feels like it, there's a tumour in the gland, it just feels hard. Um, and what do we find when we have a look? Well, we can either find that there's a, that it's diffusely um, enlarged and, and kind of hypoechoic with kind of lots of changes within it or we find that a focal um, looks like it's like a focal lesion within the glands it's kind of hypoechoic um, but the key is that the gland normally retains its normal shape instead of like bulging bulging out as if something's trying to get out out, out of the glands so next slide so this is the submandibular gland here. And then this is what was being felt clinically. This is all rather hard and firm. Um, and you can see it's kind of heterogeneous, hypoechoic appearance. And there was nothing else in the neck. There's no lymph nodes. The other side was fine. Um, so did a core biopsy on this and that came, came back as a cut in a tumor. So next, and this is just another um, so this is a longitudinal, so just turn it long ways, so you can see this, this focal um, part of the gland is abnormal. Next slide. So, so branchial clefts. So the the clue for the the typical position of a type two branchial clefts is immediately posterior to the submandibular gland border, anterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, it can appear anechoic or it can be hypoechoic with some internal debris. If you put the probe on and it's not become inflamed in the past or anything like that, you won't really see a wall to it. 
And if you just leave the probe on, you can see that the contents are just kind of swirling around, which is another clue. Okay. <clears throat> um, you won't see any, any blood flow within the center of it. The thing to do is just to scan through, because some of us see sometimes these can harbor an SCC component, and you might see that side component. And that's important because if you're going to do an FNA at that sitting, that's the bit to a target. So target any solid bit, target the wall because cytology don't want the fluid. Give them fluid, they'll just say, well, it's non-diagnostic. They need to see cells in there to confirm that it's a squamous lined cyst. That's what, they're, that's what they'll want to see. Okay, so what does it look like? So, so oh yeah, just to say, well, as Susie said, you know, People under 30 tend to think, yeah, this is kind of going to be a late presentation of a congenital etiology, which they can do. So it's often people, we see people in their mid-20s coming into clinic and they've said, oh, I've got this lump here and it's a bit painful. And what it is, is they didn't realize they had a branchial clefasis in the first place, but because it's become inflamed, this is, this is how they've presented. But obviously with things like HPV, you can't ignore kind of a, a, a cystic um, lymph node presenting as SCC in, in, in young patients that are under the age of 30. Um, and again, mandates that we do the FNA just to confirm that that's the case. If it has become inflamed, that, that kind of, you get a peripheral thickening of the wall, um, which makes your target easier for fna -ing. Um And sometimes they can be in a slightly different position. So if it's if it's behind the carotid, that could represent a, a third a type three branchial um, cleft cyst. But this, the same principles apply. If it's someone presenting who's in their forties, the first thing you want to do is to make sure that it's not a cystic metastatic lymph node, either SCC or or papillary thyroid. So always have a quick scan through the thyroid parenchyma as well, just to see if you can pick up anything in there. Um, next slide. So what does it look like? So again, kind of imperceivable, very thin wall. There's kind of debris within it, these echogenic foci, which if you were just to leave your probe on, it would just be swirling around, no blood flow in it, and you get some posterior acoustic enhancements. <coughs> and you want to basically say, so you see it between the submandibular gland and stenocladomastoid for the type two. That's the classic position. Okay. So just some, some cross-sectional imaging from different patients. So again, so you can see it's between the gland and the muscle. That's the typical location. That's what it looks like on CT. It's pound field units of about 439. And then a couple of MR. Next slide, sorry. So, um, different patient, right on T2, okay? And then with the contrast enhanced sequence, you get this peripheral rim enhancement on the next slide. Oh, I think we've, have we missed one. Oh, there, there you go, there's the peripheral enhancement there in the wall. Okay, uh, carotid space. So just do this. So, carotid. Uh, so, so carotid paraganglioma. So classically, in the bifurcation of the internal external carotid arteries, um, you'll see uh, internal vascularity, and it's always worth checking the contralateral side, especially if they have a confirmed genetic mutation. So, what does that look like? So. So we avoid biopsy if we, if we can, because of bleeding risk. Um, and obviously you want to get some cross-sectional imaging to, for, for surgical planning. So it looks like, next slide. So between the two, internal and external carotid artery, this, uh, this is the lesion here, it's splaying those two, which is the clue. Okay, you've got some blood flow in the middle of it. Next slide. Again, okay, yep, so the clue is that it's splaying the arteries. Okay. You want to stop? I can stop. Um, yeah. So we, yeah. Sorry. No. Any any questions about 
I think of it's no <laughs> very confusing. <laughs> <laughs>